there it is. It was only a matter of time, wasn't it, before Aston Martin followed suit with the Bentley Bentayga, the Lamborghini Urus, and the Porsche Cayenne Turbo with a super SUV of its own. And here it is, the Aston Martin DBX. If you follow the financial news, you'll know Aston's stock value has been falling since its IPO a year ago. So the DBX isn't just another new Aston, it's a potential lifeline for the company, which is why it's pulled out all the stops. It's based on a new platform offered initially with a more powerful version of the Vantage's 4-litre twin-turbo AMG sourced V8 and the first car to be built in Aston's brand new factory in St Athen, Wales. Failure here isn't really an option. We'll come to all the technical details in a minute, but first, let's catch up with Miles Nurnberger, Aston's Director of Design, to run a fine comb through the styling. Miles, thanks for joining us and this slightly Bond-esque location we've got up here, isn't it? It's a great place. It's, it's a, a great very, place. very nice place to be, yes. <laughs> Not like any studio I've ever been to. Anyway, the DBX. How important is this car to Aston Martin? Is it too much to say this is the car that the company's future rests on its shoulders? Um, in terms of growth, absolutely. It is a very important car. It's car four in our second century plan. So first of all, DB11, then Vantage, then DBS. And of course it's significant because actually it's the first time we go into this sector. Okay, and it's not the first time, obviously, that Aston has flirted with the idea of an SUV. There was a 2009 Lagonda concept. Famously didn't go down very well with the, um, with the media and the public. Are there any lessons learned from that concept that you've been able to apply here? Um, well, I think it was very different. It was done for Lagonda. It was done at a different time. When we've come at this one, it's been with a clean sheet of paper. I think we started from the ground up, which we were fairly young in those days. We, we've grown up a lot and understood our brand a lot more and where to take it, so. Well, may I be so bold as to say, off the bat, it's a much better looking car. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. And more Thank you. recognizably in Aston Martin. I know that was bad to Lagonda. Yeah. This is an Aston, but just talk a bit about the challenge of turning the Aston Martin design language you've worked so hard to sort of cement into something that doesn't actually sit next to a front engine GT yeah. or a I think, I think supercar. We were convinced for a while that you could interpret Aston DNA into it. We, we knew in actual fact that probably we needed the practicality. You know, if you, if you go into the SUV market today, there is just, I mean, I, I, if I show you the side of the car, I don't have to explain what you get. You know, and that's really important for the customer. What they get on top of it, though, is they get beautiful proportion and stance and all those things. Which is a nice little segue, isn't it? Because we're here to talk about this car. So without further ado, why don't we just go through it? You talk us through the design. We'll start at the front. We'll work our way to the back. Um, imagine I know nothing. I have a set of eyes. I mean, grill is the place to start, the Aston Martin grill. So, um, very much recognisable. This car is a DBX and it wears the classic DB grill that you should instantly recognise from, you know, iconic DB5. Bigger than the DB11 and the DBS? Much bigger, actually. Probably the largest grill we've ever put on a DB. If, if anything, probably, I think it's about the size of a 177 grill. We've got the DRL lamps either side. And again, Aero, we, we started all of this in a, um, adventure with Aero, Aston Martin, with DB11, and it comes through all the cars. So actually within the lamp, is actually a duct, so you get um, oh, um, an air an air blade basically running around there. You know, we're able to get this sculpture and almost this, you know, horizontal surface off the wheel arch. Instead of coming up like a wall, we can cut across the car and get all that sculpture. It is one thing I actually noticed because uh, a lot of these sort of super SUVs, as we're nicknaming them, have these really quite bulky front ends. So when you put the dimensions with these kind of boxy shapes around the front, and rear, then it can get a bit heavy, but yeah, this I mean, feels, this, it doesn't feel this, too this big. Sports cars with actually more metal above their wheels than, than our SUV does, um, which is quite amazing. You were talking about this, this being compact, so not yep. uh, as much metal as some sports cars above there, but there is quite a bit of ride height here. So you haven't, you could have, I know that this has got air suspension on it, so yeah. you can go up and down. It's quite interesting, you get a, you know, lower you get, there's a certain sportiness, higher you get obviously is off-road, mm -hmm. but there's a moment in between where you get this beautiful, elegant float. And we actually, it partly goes with this line here that we have that runs front to back, which we call the power boat line. Yep. So it's a constantly falling line. And along with the, you know, the clearance to the ground gives this very elegant. And of course, Aston Martin actually does make a power boat these days. They do, yeah. Seamless. Yeah. And just back to the wheel arch again, 
I noticed these are 22s, right? So 22s is standard. Yeah, the 22s only wheels are standard. There's two wheel styles. So this is the standard, and then there's an option style. As well. The other thing I was noticing was the, was the glass. Yep. So are my eyes deceiving me, or is this all flush and seamless, whereas normally you've got sort of protruding pillars? Yeah, so we went to a lot of effort. So um, we have glass the glass all the way through. So this, this the B post is actually a, a pane of glass. Also, I mean, it's, a, it's about reducing clutter and putting the emphasis on the right thing. So obviously we want the emphasis on this nice piece of aluminium bright work. Yeah. Actually at the bottom, all the seals are actually hidden underneath the edge of the door. Yeah. So you go straight from metal to glass without a big finisher. Okay, if we follow this C pillar around, you've got the roof spoiler up there. It appears all to be leading to this ducktail spoiler. More than the hint of vantage about that, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Absolutely, I mean, it's an SUV, but it's an SUV with a very big capital S, you know, for sports. Mm -hmm. And our sports car, the car we race, is Vantage. And very unashamedly, we've taken that and put it onto the back of the car yeah. um, to give that very unique identity to the car in profile and in, and in rear view. The ducktail, when you're on a, on a Vantage, it's got a nice clean airflow. On an SUV, normally it doesn't, which is why we have these two holes either side to actually feed, energise the flow to the, yeah. to the ducktail. But that also keeps the rear screen perfectly clear. You get a lot of circulation on the back of SUVs. And because of the hard cutoff here and the airflow down there, it keeps the rear. And you don't have to have a rear wiper. Nope. And I like these carbon fibre finishes. On the yes, wheel. yeah. So these are an option. You can say they're an they're option. They're an option. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this sort of perforated thing, something else you see on the Vantage yes. as well. So Absolutely. they work out there. All right, let's have a look at the interior. You okay. go and you hop in the passenger seat. I'm driving. All right. Okay, yeah, all right. Now, I read somewhere that it took you six months to decide the exact position of the driver's seat. <laughs> what on earth took you so long? I think it took longer than that. We did a huge amount of testing basically because we were going into this sector. And you know, you've got to have the practicalities, you've got to be able to get in and out. Mm -hmm. But also the minute you get in it and sit in it, it has to feel like an Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. We were insistent to get that right. It, it, we couldn't get to the end and go, oh, actually it's not quite what we thought. Yeah. So you are cosseted, mm -hmm. you feel cosseted, but you've got space across the dashboard. You feel like you've got that. You've got all this nice storage below yeah, yourself. Yeah, I was going to say, so this yeah. floating centre console, yeah. that's pretty much what we're talking about here, right? So you get yeah. the you get the race centre console, you feel these, you get this kind of cockpit yeah. feel, but then you've got all this space under here. Yeah. These are quite sporty seats as well. Are they DB11 related? They are very much DB11 mm -hmm. related. And again, that's where our sports car learning came in. Um, we've got a seat we've already designed that's good GT sporting long distance seat. So why not use it again? Why not yeah. use it in an SUV? Great, and there's some amazing materials in here. It smells amazing. I've just said before we turn the camera on that I love this colour, what's the colour of the leather? Sahara tan. Just so I know when I order yeah. one, yeah. Sahara tan, but also Alcantara headlining, yeah. Alcantara for the, for the whole roof line. So first time anyone's done it, I mean yeah. that was again quite a push to get those And if I'm not mistaken, in. leather speakers. Yeah, so leather perforation, so in fact yeah. we're, again a bit like on the outside where we're reducing detail but actually adding some craft into it. Yeah. So we're actually using leather for the speaker grill patterns to get this more seamless approach. Yeah throughout the car, reduce the number of split lines and create um, a beautiful bit of craft. And of course, we've got our driving modes down here. So yep. Sport, Sport Plus, GT, yep. but hill descent control because it's an SUV, right? Yep. And a couple of modes I was reading about Terrain and Terrain Plus. Who in their right mind is going to take their Aston Martin on 22 inch wheels <laughs> off road? You've got to be a madman, right? Well, there will be some. There will be some, but I think, you know, with all the SUVs, it's that ability, what you're after is the ability to escape, to go where you want to and have that freedom. Right, so that's the design. But the way this thing drives is just as crucial to do justice to that Aston badge. How then have Aston set this car up to cope with 542 brake horsepower and 516 pounds feet of rampant V8, capable of 0-62 to in 4.5 seconds and a top speed of 181 miles an hour? The first thing is an all new bonded aluminium platform, which is the same technique that Aston uses on its sports cars. The advantages of that are it's very stiff and quite light. This car weighs 2,245 kilograms, which is about 45 kilograms more than a Lamborghini Urus, but up to 150 kilograms less than a Bentley Bentayga with a V8 engine. The other thing to mention is that although Aston won't confirm that an all electric DBX is coming, this platform can be fitted with batteries and motors somewhere down the line. 
The brakes are steel, not carbon ceramic, and there's air suspension as standard, which can raise the car 45 millimeters in terrain and terrain plus modes, or lower it by 50 millimeters in sport and sport plus, 30 millimeters at motorway speeds, and up to 50 millimeters lower in access mode to help you get in and out and for loading the boot. And just like the Bentayga and Urus, there's adaptive dampers and a 48 volt anti-roll system that should keep this car unnaturally flat in corners. All that power is sent to the wheels via a nine speed automatic gearbox and a four wheel drive system that sends about 53% of the torque to the rear axle in normal running, but can send almost 100% of the power to the rear axle when required. If you've seen a video of a prototype of this car tearing up a Welsh rally stage, you'll know it's not shy of going sideways and the switchable exhausts aren't exactly mute. Now, because the DBX is a car where Uber luxury supposedly meets active lifestyles, there's a couple of cool features I wanted to show you. If you're prepared to sacrifice your spare wheel, then under the boot floor here, you can have a fully waterproof wet bag. That's where you throw your wellies and your wetsuits and your waders, and then you simply close the boot and you're back to leather lined luxury. You leave the dirt and the damp behind you. And the other one's around here. When you're getting in the back door, even if the rest of the car is caked in grime and mud, this sill section here will be nice and clean and dry so you don't get dirt on your Italian chinos. Aston knows not many of its customers will want to fang their DBX around on a rally stage. A much more lucrative strategy is to sell this car on its lifestyle benefits, hence 11 optional accessory packs. These include a snow pack with a ski bag, roof mounted ski rack and snow chains, a touring pack with a four piece luggage set and saddle bags for the rear armrest, a pet pack with a bumper protector, dog partition and portable washer for muddy paws and even an aluminium gun cabinet or picnic hamper. Prices for the DBX start from around 155 grand, which actually isn't that shocking when you consider the 265 grand Rolls-Royce Cullinan exists. And the spec sheet on this car is pretty hard to fault actually, from the huge performance to the physics defying chassis aids. My concern is that unlike a few years ago, the competition for the DBX is now numerous and really quite strong. Is the super SUV market already oversaturated? For Aston's sake, I hope not.